Good morning. Thank you for joining us for CABE webinar Wednesday session for March 2018. Today's session, we are looking at flood risk modelling and management for extreme events. My name is Katie. I'm digital um, specialist at CABE and I'll be helping you along this morning with any questions and um, technical issues that you may have. If you want to interact today, it, um, we obviously welcome questions throughout the session and on perhaps your right hand side or top of your screen, depending on um, the, how you're viewing us today, there will be the option to send in some questions. You just need to type these in on your keyboard and then they'll come up to us. Now, what we'll do is look to answer the questions perhaps towards the end of the session. So, but feel free to ask them as anything pops into your mind. Um, if you're watching this later on, we have uh, we pop these on our YouTube channel. So if you're watching this later but still have questions, you can always email us at info at cbuildy.com. And again, we'll pick up any questions and, and pass those on and address them for you. If you're on Twitter, hashtag CABECPD. Your presenter today is Ro uh, Professor Roger Falconer, and he is Professor of Water Management at Cardiff University. And he will talk you through this morning's session. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to hand over to Roger. So if you just bear with us one second whilst we quickly switch it over. And as I say, he will talk you through. So here we go. Over to you, Roger. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Roger Faulkner. I'm from Cardiff University. I've spent about uh, 40 years working on a wide range of uh, flood risk modeling and management projects. And I'm going to give you an overview this morning of my experience over the last um, 40 plus years. So um, we'll start off with a general introduction. I'm just going to make some fairly obvious points here, but I think nevertheless they may be relevant later. So we first of all have to start off with the with the clear understanding that flooding is essentially a natural process. Um, we need to adapt to climate change. There's nothing a lot, much we can do about it. We can reduce the impact of climate change. And where we know we're going to get regular flooding and the towns and cities, including, for example, London, have been built on floodplains, then we uh, need to build resistance, flood resilience into the scheme. Now, one of the problems that we face in the future is that flooding, we all know that it's caused by heavy rainfall, and this can be exacerbated by poor drainage, often dated drainage, which doesn't cope with the modern day high rainfall intensities. Groundwater saturation is another problem, uh, debris flow and so forth. The issue, the key issue is that um, we have, uh, I have uh, recently served on a government committee and the Met Office there are predicting that rainfall intensity is going to increase by typically 30% over the next 30 or 40 years, and that's all documented in a recent report. So if we think we have high rainfall intensity now, that is likely to get worse in the future. One of the other challenges we face is that flooding leads to water pollution. So in many countries in the world, for example, Pakistan, more people may die of uh, contamination from post-flood events than flooding itself. But even in the UK, where houses are polluted by fecal contamination, for example, this can be very stressing for the people, much more so than just actually being flooded by water itself. And flood, off, flood impact is often in, inadequately predicted for a number of reasons. Firstly, we may have inadequate data and warning systems, poor planning. That's less prevalent in the UK these days, but nevertheless, it has been an issue in the past. Inadequate defences or insufficient upland storage. We see that in many cases. And today I'm working on major initiatives globally to try to capture the water at the end of the estuary and the river system rather than at the top. But the one that I'd like to focus on a little bit too is the inappropriate modelling tools. Many of the people that are now running sophisticated, all singing and all dancing computer models haven't really got the background or a good training to to adequately interpret these properly or put in the correct data. There's nothing wrong with the models in most cases, but there's often um, big errors occurring in the interpretation of the data. So this map shows, it's currently showing 1986, 1997, 1987, and it goes through for the next 25 years, showing all the major floods across the world. I'm not going to sit here for 10 minutes while it goes through everything, but if you go through this map, you'll see that the flooding 
intensity and the flood impact is increasing globally quite significantly. So let's look at some of the key issues. <clears throat> if we look at the city of York, which floods regularly, this has some interesting characteristics. For example, we can see that the York Castle Keep, built in about the 13th century, is on the hilltop, never floods, obviously, so we can learn a lot from the past. But here we see modern day solutions to some of the issues of flooding. This is a hotel where the ground floor is uh, basically a car park. And this pub, which floods quite regularly, is now pretty resilient. I haven't been there recently, but I understand that basically the flood comes. It's all concrete and um, various materials inside. And 24 hours after the flood has receded, the pub is basically washed out and back in business. So these are the sort of issues we need to consider for the future in the design on the right hand side and making historic buildings and uh, um, listed buildings, for example, flood resilient for the future. The one that worries me most from my experience is flash floods. So where we have steep terrain, uh, we have this in the River Taff, and I'll just show you some examples from the Taff here. We can see that this embankment is overtopping. It's a pretty poor embankment. It's an old build. Uh, it's an old picture now. We have put weirs in the Taff in very in a wide range of locations to um, control floods. There has been a lot of enthusiasm recently to remove these weirs, but the trouble is, once you remove the weir after it's been there for 50 to 100 years or so that causes the river to be unstable and it meanders all over the place. So what we're looking at more now is to modify these weirs so that we can capture some hydropower from the weirs. Um, we've got many old bridges. If this was a single span bridge, it would be ideal, but it's not a single span bridge and replacing it's the main railway line bridge from Cardiff to the West. And you can see this is ideal for capturing debris and exacerbating the flood impact in Cardiff as a city. I'll come back to that later. And then we have a lot of embankments, all the property, all those cars to the left, and um, the, there are hundreds, literally thousands of houses to the west or left of this picture. The River Taff is on the right. And if this embankment breaks, and we did have a lot of trouble in a big storm in 1979, then thousands of properties are damaged. So this embankment, small embankment on the side of the TAF is crucial for protecting the property. The problem is when the embankment fails, we have what's called the dam break problem, which I'm going to come on to in a minute. So the characteristics of flash floods are that we have fairly steep catchments upstream. The rainfall falls, it rapidly flows into the streams and then into the rivers. People can often get stranded in the river. This picture was taken in India. And these three, four or five people lost their life, for example. So the river can rise very rapidly here. And anybody living in an area like Cardiff, for example, will know the effects of flooding because the taff rises very rapidly and falls very rapidly after a flood. Vehicles can come become unstable. We see this picture on the bottom right here and start to move. And that also exacerbates flooding and something not really well understood. And we have done a lot of work on that here in my team at Cardiff, and I'll come back to that later. <coughs> and then water contamination. I've been to many houses where uh, there, there has been significant flood damage. And the worst thing for parents very often, <coughs> excuse me, with young children, is to know that their house has been flooded with contaminated water. So I'd like to talk about briefly about two types of floods. We have the short, steep rivers and the uh, catchments. We have what we call supercritical flow. This, um, we have a very turbulent flow. And these are extremely difficult to model. So even a student on a four-year civil engineering degree at a typical British university, for example, would not really have covered enough fluid mechanics to understand the complexity of this problem. If you were to put this and to contextualize this into medical matters, this would not be a routine appendix operation. This would be major neurological brain surgery. So we are talking about modeling extremely complex processes in uh, things such as the Cumbria floods, for example, many of the rivers we have in Wales and so on. 
On the other hand, <coughs> excuse me, you have the Somerset levels. Big problem in 2014. Here we have mild slope rivers. We have the equivalent of planes flying at sub, sub what we call subsonic flow. And this is a much more straightforward problem to deal with. So if I gave this problem to our undergraduate students and said, how, let's say we wanted to model the, the river floods, they would be able to do this quite easily at the end of their course. So this, this is a problem which is um, far, far less complicated. On a medical context, it would be much more like a routine appendix operation, for example. And the difference between modeling and studying this type of flood vis-a-vis -vis this type of flood are in a completely different league with this type of flood, the steep rivers requiring a much more level, much more sophisticated level and knowledge of uh, uh, flood hydro hydrology and hydraulics. So there being a lot of needs for um, dr drivers for research for steep rivers. We've had considerable concern about non-specialist hydraulic modelers, and I've seen for myself many cases where, <coughs> excuse me, predictions have been made about where the floodplain ends, only to find that when the flood comes, it's it's much further, uh, the, the extent is much wider than uh, than um, predicted, and um, sometimes this has been explained by uh, erroneous uh, given, uh, erroneous reasons have been given for this uh, increased flood extent. But the issue has primarily been that the modeling has probably not been done properly or that the complex tools have not been used properly. There's also increasing concern about flood model accuracy for steep river basins and levee breaches. Levee breaches would be where an embankment breaks. And that's typically true in Wales, for example, where much of our terrain in Wales is quite steep. So historically, people have used what I'm going to call here. I'm not going to get into technicalities, but um, traditionally two-dimensional and one-dimensional models. Now, these are not ideal for modeling steep river terrain as they stand. So we have to go to more sophisticated tools. So this is the same in, uh, as in aerodynamics. So if you want to design a Boeing aircraft, for example, to fly at subsonic velocities, which is what you would have if you were flying to Australia, Singapore, somewhere like that in today's airlines. That is not so difficult to model as the what we call the supersonic flights, the, the Concords, for example. So we have to deal with what we call a shock and we have to be able to model a shock. So we need to refine these models and we've done a lot of research over the last 10 years in looking at subsurface surface flow interactions. That's the interaction of the river with the groundwater. So you could have a flood in, let's say, October, which has a certain flow and it doesn't cause a lot of flood damage. You can have another flood maybe in January when the groundwater is saturated, the same discharge coming down the river and you suddenly find houses get flooded. The problem is in most studies that I'm aware of, people only look at the river flow and they don't consider the groundwater interaction. That often leads to erroneous results. Then I'm gonna look at how buildings can be treated to give more uh, accurate predictions of the impact. And I'm finally gonna talk about the hazard risk to people and vehicles in floods. So I first like to take what's called the classic dam break problem, which is where you have a high water level on one side, a low water level on the other side. This is extremely difficult to model. And if we use traditional methods, we see we get the prediction <coughs> on the left-hand side. We get violent oscillations and we grossly could over-predict or under-predict the, the flood extent as the water floods down the river. The one on the right includes shock capturing. Here we're capturing this shock, shock wave as it moves downstream, and we are getting a very accurate prediction of the flood here. Now, what happens on the left is the only way that you can get an accurate solution here to give you a flood inundation extent using what I've called here a traditional model is to increase the friction on the river considerably. So we damp out all these oscillations. The trouble is by damping out these oscillations, we also damp out the height of the hydrograph, the peak flood extent, uh, flood level as it comes downstream. And so we therefore can grossly underpredict the flood impact. 
So I'll just show you an animation here of using a shock capturing model. And we are predicting here, this is a dam failure. And <coughs> the wave is moving downstream. And we find that when we include shock capturing capabilities in the model, we get very accurate predictions of laboratory data in that example I just showed you. So this sounds quite technical. And what are the issues? Well, let me take Boss Castle flood in 2004, which I'm sure you will all be aware of. This was a very short, steep river. It was very unexpected. It's a very, Boss Castle is a very picturesque town in the southwest of the UK. It's a very short river basin with a steep valley terrain. The River Valence flows into, into the, the harbour. It's very similar to many river basins across much of the UK, particularly Wales in the northwest of uh, England, for example, and a lot of Scotland, and also many worldwide. So it is a classic example of what we call the dam break, dam break flow problem. In 2004, 200 millimetres of rainfall fell in five hours. And this was predicted to be a one in 400 year return period event. And it all fell in August. And I must say, I've given many talks over the past 40 years to a wide range of audiences. And I think the British public did not really take climate change seriously until this, this particular event. I found in Rotary clubs and similar that people took climate change much more seriously after this event because the, nobody expected a massive thunderstorm in the UK in August. And I think it did. It was a wake up call to UK. There was extensive damage to properties, bridges, highways and other infrastructure. And it is still one of the best recorded extreme flood events in the UK with both what we call trans and supercritical flows. And that means that we are close to what's called a, um, a fraud number of one. And the fraud number is similar to the Mark number in aerodynamics. So here's your uh, valley terrain. And note this small bridge. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So here you can see a picture of a typical uh, summer's day in Boss Castle. And it's a small river. And here you can see the bridge upstream. <coughs> Excuse me. There is no fencing to keep the cars out of this river. In 2004, we have the event which you see here depicted by these four pictures. We have a massive flood coming through the, the little village of Boscastle itself. And in particular, a car got stuck in this bridge in the bottom right hand corner, causing a significant increase in the water levels upstream. So we've been studying this project and we wanted to determine the model that would be most accurate in predicting the, this flood event. We looked at three different types of schemes. It's a little bit technical here, but I don't want to get into technicalities. What I'm going to call the TVD scheme includes the capability of modeling a shock. So in other words, this would be just like the capability of modeling the flight to Concorde in an aerodynamics problem. Then we've taken out the shock capturing, and I've just called that the McCormick scheme. And then we have the simple inertia term, which, which um, removes many of the complexities in modeling floods. And we wanted to predict the main flood parameters, the water elevations, the flood inundation extent, and we were able to compare this with rack marks. So there were rack marks at um, 30 sites throughout the village after the flood event. So these were the peak water levels. And we're modeling this domain shown in the top picture, and we're modeling the River Valence coming in on the right hand side. So here you can see the model predicting the flood coming down. And the buildings are all there. And you can see that it's getting worse as the flood comes down. And if we look at the predicted water levels against the rack marks for this TVD scheme, which is what we're calling the shock capturing scheme, you can see it agrees very closely with the field data. Now, this is the interesting picture. This shows you the picture of the flood in elevations and the predictions for the three cases. The first one on the top left is the TVD scheme. This is the most accurate one. The one on the right is the, the what I would call a traditional two-dimensional model. And you can see here it's predicting much lower levels of um, fl flood levels. So therefore, this, this model on the right, the traditional model that's widely used, 
would not be predicting flooding where we know flooding occurred. And then if we go to the inertia, inertia free model, which is what you get for rapid assessment tools, it's again not accurate for various reasons. And we can see here below that if we look at the efficiency in terms of the accuracy, the predictions, that the shock capturing model is a lot more accurate. Now, this is another example of where it's really important, in my opinion, for steep terrains to, to have specialist people working on the modeling for predicting design of flood defenses, et cetera, for the future. Here is a small village in Wales, and uh, it, it comes from, if we go to the bottom right-hand picture here, this is the, the town of Borth. The river comes down a very steep terrain. It's, it's a very small river, actually, and then flows along the um, horizontal floodplain until it gets to the, to the estuary at the top right-hand part of this picture. Now, there's a caravan site at the bottom left-hand no, it's, it's the bottom left-hand part by the beach. You can see the beach here. This, this flood was shown on British television, and we saw many pictures of the caravans being moved around as a result of the flood. So we know that the caravan site flooded. Here you can see some pictures. You can see uh, the caravan site in the bottom left-hand picture, and you can see there's quite extensive flooding of this particular caravan site. I've just taken the caravan site as an example here to make my point. Now, this is the domain that we modeled, and the flow comes down from the where it says the liver, River Larry in particular. On the bottom right, it goes through the town of Talibon, it then heads towards both, and then it goes pretty well straight, parallel, almost parallel to the beach, and it flows into the Dovey estuary. Depths were monitored at these three sites, Talabont, Both, and uh, Dalabont. And these three, these uh, measurements were taken by Natural Resources Wales. Now, if we look at the picture on the left, this is the TVD model. We can see here there's a lot more extensive flooding where the caravan site was. And this model predicts accurate, quite accurately that the caravan site would have flooded. And if had we used this, this type of model, we would have been able to show that quite convincingly. The model in the middle, which is the traditional uh, model, does not show anywhere near such um, flood impact in the caravan site. And likewise, the inertia model, which is the rapid assessment tool, uh, doesn't give us very good predictions either. And here again, we have some comparisons of the uh, predicted water levels, and we see that this, this TVD scheme gives far better results. So before moving on, I'd just like to make a concluding point here. When we have steep terrains, as we have in many parts of the UK, we are moving to a much more complex uh, flood modeling system. And in my opinion, we need to be looking for a much higher level of expertise in predicting the future scenario of flood impact in these sorts of basins, because we could get it hopelessly wrong. So the next problem that I'd like to talk about is the way we treat buildings in computer models. The way normally a building is treated is to block it out. This has a number of disadvantages in my view. So buildings in urban environments, they're difficult to treat in computer models. In fact, in many ways, they're a bit of a pain. We could do with just no buildings in our environment for a whole host of reasons. And also, if we're going to design a town from scratch or we're going to build a new part of a city from scratch, for example, and particularly where it's near a floodplain, then if we can start with our basin without the buildings and then play around with the buildings to optimize or minimize the, the flood impact, then it's quite attractive to be able to remove the buildings in our model and treat them differently. So we looked at three modeling approaches. One is the traditional approach, which is to model the buildings as solid blocks. Effectively, the building is completely impervious, doesn't allow any water into it. We've looked at another problem, which is another, another uh, modeling approach, which is to remove the building and increase the local roughness. And the third one is to treat the building as though it was a porous media, just like groundwater problems. So here we have our reservoir. We have a dam break failure problem again. We have a square building below. 
the picture on the left here, the top left, shows you the build, no building. That's the one I showed you earlier for the experiments done in the uh, in the Netherlands. The, build, the, the model prediction on the right shows you the building as a solid block. So this is a skyscraper, for example. <coughs> if we treat it as a porous media, we've now removed the building. There is no building physically in the modeling. But what we've done, we've replaced it with an extremely impervious rock. Uh, sorry, po uh, extremely porous rock. This is equivalent to what you might have, like, in, uh, for example, in a store like Tesco. If you have Tesco or any of the major supermarkets, they're quite commonly located near the floodplain. And if they do flood, water will get through the gaps uh, around the building and so forth. So this is more typical of what we get in reality. So we went on to look at the city of Glasgow and tried to model the city of Glasgow. The buildings are shown on the right. We've removed the buildings in, in the modeling here and replaced them with treating the buildings that you see on the right as though it was a porous media. And here we can see we can get exactly the same effect. So we can model our design of our cities by instead of treating them as buildings, we can treat them as porous blocks. And that helps us a lot in many uh, considerations. Where is, the, where is the contaminated water going to go and so forth? The next issue that I would like to talk about is debris flow. And debris flow is quite complex if you think of debris in terms of trees and so forth, because every tree floating down the river in a flood is different. So we have just, <coughs> excuse me, we have just concentrated here on looking at cars. And we saw in the Boss Castle flood that um, a lot of damage or the flood was made a lot worse when a car got stuck in the bridge, as you see here in this uh, example on the right, where this yellow car is coming down the river and then it ends up blocking this uh, small bridge. And if I go back to the Boss Castle, this is a very nice example to talk to first year undergraduate students. I asked them how would they solve the problem of reducing flood risk in, in, in Boss Castle? And they come up with loads of complex, very expensive problems. Rather reminds me of the story of the emperor's got no clothes on. But if you go back to the boss castle scenario, the obvious thing to do really is to fence off the river. And it could be done quite nicely with posts every 10 meters, for example, and a strong steel bar between there and foot, footpaths into the river. So that if you do ever get a flood event again, similar to the one in 2004, the cars just wouldn't be able to get into the river. However, it's not been done yet. And of course, we often have some uh, lighthearted experiences where even the emergency services, in this example, okay. So here we've been doing modeling of uh, an embankment breach in the River Thames to properties. And um, I just let this animation go through. And here we can fly around and so forth. And if we look at flood defense, before I come back to the car, um, I put a couple of slides in on flood defense. I've been quite heavily involved in flood defense. We have the major flood defense structures like the Thames barrier. And they're looking at a similar type of barrier now for the Somerset levels, for example. <clears throat> but what worries me a little bit from my own personal experience of talking to people who have been flooded <clears throat> is, again, if we're looking at the Somerset level type scenario, the, the, more, the fairly traditional flood defense structures are, 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 are most appropriate. I, I was at one time involved in the design of this particular uh, product, for example. Uh, but flood defense prop, uh, protection of properties, uh, the one that I've just shown you there was, in my view, a state-of-the-art flood defense for certain types of projects, protecting homes and properties from flooding. Uh, you need to design your accessories for the brick sealant, the one-way toilet valves, and so forth. So it's not just flooding from coming the water coming through doors and windows. And this particular design has the attraction that if you look at the bottom left-hand corner or the one to the top right, 
where the door is protected by a curved structure, that is similar to the, to the arch dam principle where the mountain takes the force. I'll show you a picture in a minute. These are simple glass reinforced plastic guards. So the principle of the arch dam is you curve your dam and you direct your water pressure forces towards the mountain and the mountain takes the load. <coughs> the same in these uh, flood guards. Um, the design is such that the water pressure is on the outside of the house and you, the sea, as the water level rises, the, the seal is strengthened. The problem is with a lot of these designs, I've seen many places where people have spent a lot of money on them and only then to find that they're still flooded. They're, and again, when you look at flood defences, it's not, it's not quite the same as putting in double glazed windows. A double glazed window, uh, the more you pay, the better quality the windows, but nevertheless, the problem, it, it, there's not much technicality in coming in, into the problem other than maybe structural issues. But if you look at flooding, you really have to understand the flooding problems before you come up with a solution. And my concern in many cases is that people are being sold flood, flood, flood defense devices for totally inappropriate scenarios where, again, there's limited knowledge of the flooding. If you go to Boss Castle, uh, sorry, if you go to the Somerset levels, for example, the, the, flood, the flood water remained high for quite some time. And then, of course, what happens, as you will know, is that the water seeps underneath the flood. Uh, defense uh, devices and often 15 20 hours later people start to find that the water is coming through the, f the floor so again flood designing a flood defense for a, making a property resilient in somerset levels for example will be very different from the requirements for a flood property in somewhere like cumbria where you've got steep slopes and very different type of flood where the water, where the river rises rapidly and falls rapidly so i want to come back to this incipient uh, velocity that's the velocity when the vehicle starts to move and i got interested in this project when i was working in boss castle and it's highlighted a number of challenges which i think we face for the future and how we can help out emergency services and so forth provide better support to the public when floods come so we undertook a study to determine what's called the incipient velocity for fully submerged vehicles to start with. And then we moved on to look at partially submerged vehicles and modern vehicles are pretty, pretty watertight on the whole. So we desire, derived, we went back to basically uh, undergraduate fluid mechanics. We did ex scaled experiments with um, model cars expensive cars they were about 200 pounds each bought from an expensive shop and they were put in our flumes to study in detail we looked at the water levels and we measured the um, velocities at which the car started to move this is called the incipient velocity we have it in sediment transport as well you increase your velocity in the river until the sediment particle starts to move and at the velocity when the sediment particles start to move we call this the incipient velocity so we wanted to work out what velocity in a flood would cause, or depth, or depth of water, the combination of the two, would cause a vehicle to move. So I don't want to go into the theory here in any detail, but if you go back to first year fluid mechanics, then the forces on the car and what causes it to move are basically proportional to the depth and the square of the velocity. Um, and I'm going to come back to this point about the square of the velocity later. So here you can see the car. This is a van. We looked at three mm -hmm. typical types of project problem um, um, vehicles, a van, a Pajero car, and a small saloon car. We put them in our flume, which you see on the left-hand side. And here you can see a picture of the car in the flood river, in the river. The flood is, the water level is increasing. And at this stage, the car, the vehicle is still stationary. <laughs> so we've got our graphs here of uh, the water depth on the bottom and the velocity on the left and you can see a line is drawn here if you uh, if your depth is uh, let's say if we take the top picture on the left 0.2 meters and your velocity which is on the left hand side of that graph is 0.4 then we're below the line and the car doesn't move if, in contrast, the depth is 0.2 meters and the velocity is 1.4 meters, the car moves. So we then decided 
that actually it would be very helpful for people not just to know whether cars in a car park are going to start to move if there's a flood, but what happens to people and in particular children and which streets in a community where would children be particularly vulnerable to flooding? So that if we knew there was a flood coming, then perhaps the emergency services and the uh, environment agency, for example, could make sure that the children are removed from the streets where they may be playing football and may be most vulnerable in the event of a sudden uh, flood event, such as an uh, embankment failure, which happens almost instantly. So we wanted to adopt a similar approach to the cars, but looking at people. So recently, uh, recent studies for submerged human bodies are based on the formula derived from fundamental fluid mechanics. We again did experiments on scaled models. We're not allowed in the UK to model uh, actual humans in flumes, for example, um, but uh, we, we worked with models. So we accept that a human would resist a flood more than perhaps a model. But nevertheless, the model gives us some indication of, um, of, of, of the incipient velocity. And we wanted to calculate the incipient velocity for prototype bodies, both for children and adults. So here we see a sketch where the red line is a typical, um, uh, it, what we call an incipient velocity curve for a child, and the black line is for an adult. So if we look at the one for a child, for example, and I think these were 11-year-old children, these particular plots, a typical 11-year-old child. If the velocity, if the depth is 0.6 meters and the velocity is 0.5 meters, then the child is about to be uh, lifted off its feet and taken away with the flood. For an adult, that value is more like two meters per second. So here's a model. Here's the model shown. Uh, it, we these a lot of these experiments were done by a colleague who worked with us at Cardiff and then went back to Wuhan University in China, and we just have a big grant from the Royal Academy of Engineering to continue this work for the future. And um, we we would be keen to work more closely with local authorities on these these sorts of problems. So if anybody is working with a local authority and is keen to collaborate with us on this, we would be, we would be delighted to, to engage. So please contact me afterwards if that's the case. So here we're looking at the forces in the body in the flood, and this body is just standing, um, not, not offering any resistance to motion. They, I don't dwell on the equations, but here we see the, the curves for flat ground, uh, a child, for example, on the right, and this is the blue is flat ground, the red is with a slope, and the lighter color, um, the black thin line, is for a steeper slope again. What this drew to my attention was the fact that in the UK we are using a hazard formula, which is the one that's shown here, and this is used by DEFRA. And in my view, this, this formula has some shortcomings because it works out the hazard risk of someone being affected by a flood, and it links the depth multiplied by just the velocity, h times u. And we know that if you're a pedestrian, for example, and you get hit by a car, the car is a momentum which is proportional to the square of the velocity. So if a car hits you at 10 miles per hour or another car hits you at 20 miles per hour, the 20 mile per hour car is going to have four times as much force on you as the car traveling at two miles an hour. And a flood, uh, sorry, 10 miles an hour. And the flood is exactly the same. So if we go back to first year fluid mechanics, which I used to teach the students in Cardiff until recently, the, the force on an object in a flow is proportional to the square of the velocity. Now, if you're dealing with Somerset levels and your velocity of your water is um, maybe half a meter per second, then H times U or H times U squared doesn't make much difference. But if you're looking at flooding in an urban environment where you've got extensive uh, steep terrain, Bradford, for example, Glasgow, many cities across the UK, many small towns, I showed you pictures earlier of both and so forth. And if you want to predict the hazard risk and find out which streets are going to be most vulnerable to children being knocked off their feet and possibly even drowned because they couldn't cope with the flood, then we need to link this to the square of the velocity, not the velocity. 
So we've done quite a lot of work on this, and um, we then went back to model an urban environment in Glasgow, the one I showed you earlier, and we took measurements to start with at all these sites. We've also done the same at Boss Castle and a number of other sites. And we have a hydrograph coming through this urban environment, and the peak flow is 10 cubic meters per second. You can see the picture on the top right-hand corner. <coughs> and this hydrograph goes in through the point X0, and then there are all these streets. So the next plot, which I'm showing you now, shows the predicted peak water levels as this hydrograph or flood goes through these streets. The bottom picture shows you the maximum velocity. Well, this is the sort of thing you get from the consulting companies at the moment, where they will predict the flood and inundation extent, and you can predict the water levels and the velocities. But this doesn't really tell you much if you're thinking of the emergency services. And if you think of this urban environment, which is the area you want to focus on? So, first of all, the top pictures here, A and B, show you the areas where A shows you where a Pajero might be moved. So if you have cars in the street, the Pajero is most likely to be moved, hardly likely to be moved anywhere, actually. In contrast, a Mini Cooper is going to be moved in quite a few places, and particularly those places in red. So the hazard risk to the Mini Cooper being moved and then blocking the street, possibly even blocking the emergency services being able to get down the street, is going to be those areas in red. So if you, want, if you know you've got a flood coming, and you need to move cars urgently, then the best place to focus, for example, is those shown in red on the top right-hand picture. And then we come to the bottom picture. We've got children playing in the street. We've just got a burst, uh, failed embankment. Those areas shown in red are where children are particularly vulnerable to extreme flood events. The, and they would, they would not be able to uh, stand up and, and manage, manage um, themselves so well in, in those areas shown in red. So we feel this offers um, a valuable contribution to better flood risk management in urban environments, and particularly where you have um, steep terrains, for example. <clears throat> so in conclusion, accurate modeling of flooding in steep river basins <clears throat> excuse me, requires shock capturing models or more sophisticated tools than are often currently uh, used. Sometimes in my experience, these models will grossly underpredict the extreme flood event, which um, is not expected that often. The treatment of buildings can be improved and can be used more in um, as an effective tool in designing uh, an urban environment for minimal flood impact and minimum contamination afterwards by not modeling the building as a solid block, which is what is done now, but treating the building as a low porosity uh, environment. And that also allows you to link things to the groundwater then. So you can look at the interaction between the surface water and the groundwater. The analysis undertaken to predict the effectiveness of defense structures to protect um, properties, uh, we have done quite a bit of work on this. And we have concluded that unlike uh, double glazing, for example, where you can pretty well insert a well-designed product in any building anywhere across the UK, you have to look at the characteristics of the flood when you design your flood defense for a property. So sometimes people have gone for the cheapest option only to find that the first flood has come along and it's not been very effective. So you can't just assume that what works in Somerset levels to protect the property from flooding is going to work in Cumbria and vice versa. So you need a much more holistic approach, which unfortunately is going to cost a lot more money. And you need you need people to look at the hydraulics properly and work out what is going to be the best type of solution for that particular problem. We developed new formally in our research group at uh, Cardiff University to predict the critical velocity and depth for people and vehicle safety in floodwaters. And we believe this is a valuable addition to the existing flood inundation extent modeling that's often undertaken by consulting companies. And we've also developed new formula for flood hazard risk. And we believe that our formula for flood hazard risk is much more reflective of the true risk in urban environments because it's linked to the square of the velocity rather than just the velocity. And this is really important in determining the variation in risk. If you have a flood where the velocity is three or four meters per second, for example, 
then three squared is nine and three squared is much more significant than just three so um that's basically my brief overview of the work we've been doing in my research team at uh, Cardiff University for the last uh, 20 years at Cardiff and before that I was at Bradford. So I know flooding is a big problem across the UK and things are generally in some respects getting worse and more challenging for the future with the effects of climate change. So back to you Katie. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. That was a really interesting presentation this morning. Um, if anybody's got any questions, now's your time to type those in, send them over to us for Roger to answer. Um, and whilst you're doing that, I'll just bring your attention to our next webinar. That's to take place on Wednesday, the 25th of April. And with that one, we're looking at cavity barriers and external wall systems. Um, and the presenter will be Dr. Gary White of BB7. So he'll be delivering the next presentation that we have. So again, if there's, uh, if you want to join us, you'll receive an email after this, uh, if, after this session, and um, you can just register that way. So again, if, just give you a couple more minutes on any questions that are coming in. As at this stage, there's nothing, nothing there at the moment, but I'll give you benefit of the doubt, and you can have another minute. Um, so feel free to send, say, any questions through. We've also got webinars coming up um, looking at um, BIM, we've got energy and also looking at um, basement waterproofing as well. And again, you'll get the links to those. Um, there's no questions here. So on that note, what I will do is I will end the session. Um, again, thank you, Roger, for your time this morning. Really interesting and useful presentation. If anybody does think of any questions or anything that you do want to send over, you can just drop me an email and I'll forward those on to Roger. And, oh, there's a question. Here we go. <laughs> Roger, um, question just coming in um, about the modelling package that's used. What What is the package that you use to do, uh, to do your modelling? Is that something you can answer? We use, we use our own modeling tools, but those are research tools. We have worked closely with um, um, originally Halcro, then it became CH2M, and now it's now it's called Jacobs. And those modeling um, modifications are included in versions of their mod, Flood Modeler Pro. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, again, as I say, that's... That's all that's just coming for now. So as I say, I'll close the session, but like I say, pop any questions through to me, but thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for your time at, um, at eight o'clock on a Wednesday morning and we will see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay,